Hello and welcome to Hermetic Journeys. What I should really say is welcome back to Hermetic Journeys. Humblest apologies to those of you who have subscribed over the past few months and have been quite a few and it's wonderful. Thank you for subscribing and received nothing from me over the past three months. Okay, well, there's a reason for this. I decided to go to Egypt. Actually, Amy said to me, you're going to Egypt. And I said, oh, okay. Since I was knee-high to a grasshopper, whatever that means, uh, really young, uh, my grandma Beaker, my, my mom's mom, uh, had a collection of books by a man named Edgar Cayce. Now, if you don't know who Edgar Cayce is, look him up. He was known as the sleeping prophet, the father of holistic medicine. He would go into trances, tapping into the what is called the Akashic Records, and go into trances and speak different languages and talk about times long past. One of the books he wrote was on Egypt, specifically Atlantis and Egypt. And I was absolutely blown away by this book. It, it just ignited my mind with all of these questions. And ever since then, all right, 64 years later, I'm st I still have the same excitement and, and, uh, and, and questions about Egypt. In fact, after going there, I probably have more, quest more questions than I have answers. But it's okay. That's what life's about, right? Really, really cool stuff. We normally cover a book called Atalanta Fugians. It's Atalanta Fugians, all right? It's by a, a physician slash alchemist named Michael Meyer. So why are we focusing on this book? Well, first of all, it's an incredible alchemical treatise. There are 50 emblems, 50 pictures that are all symbolic. And there are, of course, text giving you clues as to what those images are about. And then there is sheet music to go along with it that has to do with the alchemical theories. It is the world's first multimedia book. Really, really cool. So if you're interested, if that sounds really cool to you, please subscribe. And over the next few years, we'll be continuing to work on this book. We're on Emblem 15. Um, so just please indulge me. For those of you who signed up for Atlanta Fugans, please indulge me. Uh, uh, for the next two videos. This video is gonna focus on the pyramids and what the pyramids taught me, okay? And the next video is gonna be on the temples and the Sphinx <laughs> and what they taught me. There's our introduction. Let's take a look at the tour. The tour I took was called Adept Expeditions, Lost Technologies and Symbolism Tour of Egypt. And it's a brainchild of a very interesting fellow named NEXT. NEXT was very successful in the music industry. He had his own record label. He was an artist in his own right. He abandoned all that to do these tours, to explore the esoteric nature of humanity, if you will. NEXT is an author, esoteric researcher, filmmaker, and tour leader. And he is incredibly well read, <laughs> incredibly. And I would consider him to be an expert on all things alternative, like alternative theories, um, on what, the more esoteric nature of things, and most importantly to me, the symbolist perspective on ancient Egypt. Now he was joined by two additional amazing people, experts in their fields, uh, Sohalia Hussein, who is an expert in Egyptian culture and certainly ancient Egyptian culture as well. She can read hieroglyphs. I mean, you wanna learn about a culture, learn the language. Learn the language because that's where cultures live. She was excellent and really knowledgeable. I mean, and very passionate about her culture. You know, she is a descendant of these incredible people who built these things, right? It's amazing. So uh, certainly Sohalia was incredible. So NEXT, Sohalia, and of course, our third guy was none other than Christopher Dunn. Christopher Dunn is an engineer who's written two fascinating books. His newest one, Lost Technologies of Ancient Egypt, explores the advanced engineering. Um, he looks at some of the structures in Egypt and he sees the perfection in the way they are created and is looking at it from an engineer's standpoint, saying, this was not created by human hands, this had to be machined in some way. Really interesting stuff. And the Giza Power Plant. This is the book that I would say put him on the map. In this book, Dunn offers his perspective through his expertise in engineering and leaves you speechless in many ways concerning his thoughts on the true purpose of the Great Pyramid. He goes into great detail about his theory, which essentially is that the Great Pyramid was a geomechanical power plant that drew energy from the earth and converted it to microwave energy. Man, oh man, let me tell you something. You wanna read a really interesting book? I mean, both books are great, I recommend both, but this one is just, it boggles your mind. I mean, he's a brilliant engineer. The other part of it is he's extremely funny. 
<laughs> very witty and oh, so wonderfully irreverent. Oh, I just love the guy. So um, certainly uh, check out these two books because you will not be disappointed. They are absolutely fascinating. Here's the, here's the benefit to doing NEXT's tours, okay? You get three unique perspectives, okay? Yet NEXT who covers the esoteric and the spiritual and the, the uh, symbolist perspective. Then you get Sahila who covers the traditional historic Egyptian perspective. And she also worked with John Anthony West for years and years and years. If you don't know who John Anthony West is, well, look him up and you'll be blown away. Uh, she worked with him as well. So you get, and then you get Christopher Dunn, who's an engineer, and he has his perspective. So you get three unique perspectives, and you can choose for yourself. You know, some of these tours are, are, are guided by a particular agenda. They want to convince you of something, okay? But this tour doesn't do that. Um, it explores the various perspectives and the various theories concerning not just the pyramids, but the Sphinx and the, and the temples and everything. Um, and it lets you decide. I mean, you should be deciding, right? They're giving you all the information, laying it out for you beautifully, um, eloquently, and allowing you to decide what you think is the real story. And plus, you'll be there. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the pyramids. <laughs> Okay, let's talk about the pyramids, man. It's like my favorite subject. Um, I'm going to talk about four things. Number one, uh, exploring the pyramids, and you will see some uh, rather uh, terrifying video of me uh, attempting to, to get through these tunnels uh, and passageways and things in the pyramids. It's really, actually, really cool stuff. It's so much fun and kind of scary for me, too, but we'll, we'll get into that. Number two, my big question concerning the pyramids, you know, their purpose, uh, and I have... Uh, Big questions about that, okay? As everybody does, because there's no definite answers. You know, there's there's no evidence that tells us how the pyramids were built or when they were built. It's it's all kind of supposition and and theories. Okay, Egyptologists have done an incredible job of trying to figure this stuff out because it, there's not enough information, right? They've done the best they can based on the information that they have, and look, uh, that's all we have, right? So we're gonna have to go with that. Uh, number three this little cigar box that just might change our perception of when the pyramids were built and who built them. It's really interesting, uh, the contents of this innocuous little cigar box. So we'll get to that too. And of course, at the very end, I'm gonna to talk to you about, you know, uh, what the pyramids taught me. Um, and that's kind of the apex of this video, okay? Um, concerning the pyramids, I think we need to give you some context. We're gonna look at the traditional Egyptological timeline. And as you can see, here's a pyramid building timeline that I put together. It should be understood that all these massive pyramids were constructed within a very small time frame. According to traditional Egyptological perspectives and theories, all these pyramids were built within 120 years by the pharaohs Huni, Djoser, Sneferu, Khufu, Khafre, and Menkare. These kings constitute what we would call the fourth dynasty of the Old Kingdom, roughly from 2630 BC to 2510 BC. So here they are, the pyramids in the traditional chronological order, uh, according to Egyptologists, archeologists, and historians, okay? So let's start with the first one. And the first one is the Step Pyramid of King Djoser. Now this pyramid was built around 2630 BC and it's, it's believed to be the first pyramid ever built. But it's not what you would call a true pyramid. Well, what's a true pyramid? Well, a true pyramid is like the Great Pyramid. It has smooth sides. Unlike the other pyramids, this pyramid, the Step Pyramid of King Djoser, you can walk right into. Oh my goodness, I was shocked, okay? So actually what we're gonna see is uh, our group walking down the staircase, the staircase underneath the pyramid, down through a tunnel. So please, enjoy. Entering the Step Pyramid of King Djoser. Easier than Unas, looks like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. Whoa. Whoa. Oh, this is cool. Whoa. Cool, yeah? Cool, cool too, in many, many ways. <laughs> Inside. So, Sir Kilometer, for the first time, 
cool <laughs> I thought that was so cool and you can just walk into it and that chamber oh my god what the heck is that about right really really cool stuff all right so the next pyramid number two on our list is the Pyramid of Meidum, all right? Now, the Pyramid of Meidum, the construction of it was started by King Huni and finished by a pharaoh who was believed to be his son, although there's no direct evidence supporting that, Pharaoh Sneferu. As you can see, this pyramid looks something like the Step Pyramid. However, it was at one point a true pyramid, all right? But the outer shell or the outer casing and structure of the pyramid just collapsed. And what we're seeing, what you see here, is the internal structure of the pyramid. It's really interesting. We did not explore this pyramid, but I wanted you to see that this was the second pyramid that is believed to have been built. Okay, now let's talk about the pyramid that probably changed my life. <laughs> this is the Great Pyramid, really. Uh, changed my perspective on a lot of things. Okay, the Bent Pyramid, as you can see, it's called the Bent Pyramid because uh, at some point the slope or the angle of the pyramid was changed due to what was believed to be structural instability. So the original slope of 54 degrees was modified to 43 degrees to ease the, the uh, pressure on the lower structure. Apparently, as they were building it, they began to see cracks in the internal structure of the pyramid, and so they changed the angle. That's the traditional Egyptological view of this. Now, there are many alternative views talking about the fact that this pyramid has two chambers and two entrances, okay? Uh, it is believed by some folks that the two chambers represented two resonant frequencies. In other words, the ancient Egyptians were using sound to heal people, whether it was through toning, meditate, meditative toning and things like that, to heal people, to align the various energy centers of the, of the body. It's very interesting stuff. And that's what the alternative view is of this pyramid, why there are two chambers and two entrances, right? I can tell you that the pyramids themselves, every pyramid I entered, I, to me felt somehow functional, okay? I'm not saying I completely agree with Chris Dunn and his theory about the Giza power plant, although I think it's fascinating and certainly could be true. Um, however, I can tell you that my feeling being inside these pyramids was that they were functional in some way. Now, whether that was through an initiatory process or it was a symbolic representation of the Pharaoh's journey of the soul, right, of Ka, uh, or whether it was, uh, they were machines. I don't know, okay, I don't know. I can only tell you how I felt. So that's that's the, uh, the basic idea here of the Bent Pyramid. It's actually an incredible structure. As you can see from this video, looking at the, the casing stones here, and by the way, this is the only pyramid that still exists that has most of its casing stones. These 
stones were interlocked. And, and I can tell you that I've seen videos of engineers scratching their heads saying, how the hell did they do this? When you look up, as you can see in this shot here, it's smooth as glass. It's, just, it's, it's an astonishing thing. I mean, this is really, this pyramid blew my mind, okay? Now, let's take a look at the video of me not so graciously, actually rather, <laughs> rather disharmoniously uh, descending th through the first passage. Okay, then pyramid, here we go. And thank you to my friend Brennan for the second part of this footage. It doesn't get any better. <laughs> Quite the hermetic journey. Oh <laughs> As you can see from these photographs, there once you get to the main chamber, there are staircases, six flights of stairs that take you up to a small tunnel. This small tunnel links together the two chambers we talked about earlier. So by traversing it, you go from one chamber to the other. At that point, I fell in a beautiful breeze zone. It's really, really comforting. And you get out into this little hallway here, as you can see in this video, all right? And then there's one more uh, climb up to the very top chamber of the, of the pyramid. I, I did receive uh, quite uh, an education from this pyramid concerning myself, which I'll talk about at the end of this video. Okay, the Red Pyramid. Now, I didn't go inside the Red Pyramid because as I said before, my, physically I couldn't do it. Uh, my legs were in really bad shape after getting, going through the Bent Pyramid. because Right after the Bent Pyramid, we went to the Red Pyramid. So, I only took pictures of the outside, of the exterior of the pyramid. But just so you know, the Red Pyramid was built around 2575 and was attributed to Sneferu. It's 344 feet tall and, and it's the third largest pyramid in Egypt, actually. So this is, you've got the Great Pyramid and then the Second Pyramid, which we'll get to, and then you've got this, the Red Pyramid that was built by Sneferu. It ha also has two chambers, like the Bent Pyramid. It's called the Red Pyramid because when the casing stones fell off or were taken off the pyramid, the limestone underneath it had a red hue to it, so it was called the Red Pyramid. But in any case, that's the story of the Red Pyramid. The next three pyramids are the last of the seven pyramids we're talking about. These three pyramids are located on the Giza Plateau in Cairo, and these are the most famous pyramids that you see depicted anytime someone talks about the pyramids of Egypt. Okay, uh, the Great Pyramid. I don't really even know how to express to you the majesty and awe that affects you when you stand before this massive structure. It's difficult to get a sense of scale, so I used Google Earth to compare the Great Pyramid to something you may be able to relate to. Here's the Statue of Liberty, which is 305 feet tall, but when compared to the Great Pyramid, which is 454 feet tall, it puts it into the proper perspective, wouldn't you say? So picture a 40-story building, next time you go to a city, a 40-story building, add a couple of floors to that, and that's the height of the Great Pyramid. It has a footprint of 13 football fields, 2.3 million stones, the average stone weighing two tons, with stones that are inside the King's Chamber that comprise the ceiling of the King's Chamber, weighing in at 70 tons each. How did they do this? <laughs> that's, 
that's what you come away with. You, you, you stand before this thing, and, and there are lots of vendors there, you know, trying to sell you stuff, <laughs> trying to sell you crap. And that's, look, they're trying to make a living. It's cool. I get it. They can be very distracting. However, the Egyptian people are really, really wonderful people. Um, and they're funny. They really, really did sing sense of humor. So in any case, uh, I'm standing there before the, before the Great Pyramid, and I'm just in awe of this thing because it's just, it's so freaking huge. And it... The precision that went into this thing, how do you make something so huge with such precision with copper saws and copper chisels? I didn't take a lot of video inside the Great Pyramid because I was trying to experience it. I did take some photos though, which I would love to show you here. This is a diagram of the internal structures of the Great Pyramid. There's a rather large tunnel that was made by a caliph named al Mahmun, circa 820 AD. And here's a nice picture of me standing in that tunnel just before entering the pyramid. al Mahmun's tunnel leads to both the ascending passage, which leads to the upper chambers of the pyramid, and the descending passage, which leads to a subterranean chamber. Here's a photo I took of the ascending passage, which leads to the most magnificent grand gallery. And if you so choose, the queen's chamber directly below it. The Grand Gallery in this photo I took is over 30 feet tall and 150 feet long on a very steep incline. Let me tell you that this is an incredible section of the pyramid whose purpose is completely baffling to me, <laughs> baffling to most people actually. Of course, there are lots of theories, right? Going further on, you come to another long passage through which you must crawl and which eventually takes you into the king's chamber where there's a lone granite box. I didn't take this photo, it's from Wikipedia. I was told it's illegal to post pictures that I took of the king's chamber, so I'm not posting any images here. The king's chamber is a remarkable part of the pyramid. It has astonishing acoustic properties that have to be experienced to be believed. Now remember I talked about the two chambers of the bent pyramid possibly serving as frequency generators used for healing? Well, when you're in the king's chamber of the Great Pyramid, it's easy to draw correlating parallels between these two structures. Again, this is an alternative theory, but a lot of work has been done concerning this concept. If you go back down the Grand Gallery, you'll find yourself at the tunnel leading to the queen's chamber. You go through this tunnel, and in the queen's chamber, there's what is called a niche. It's this strange looking uh, cutout in the wall. And you see, here's a picture of me standing in that cutout. Of course, then you can head back down the ascending passage, all right, and make your way out to the outside of the pyramid, which is what I did. So there are some of the internal structures and chambers of the Great Pyramid. Okay, the exterior of the pyramid, or the Great Pyramid, when it was originally built, was apparently built with a white Tura limestone, okay? And we have historical records of people who saw it with its casing stones on, and apparently it, when the sun hit it, it was so bright it nearly blinded them. What you see today uh, is the pyramid that has been stripped of its casing stones. In this photo, you can see the original casing stones that completely covered the Great Pyramid in its original construction. You can see the precision of these casing stones and imagine them completely covering this colossal structure. The mind reels. <laughs> but in any case, um, that's what you see today. So you don't even see the pyramid as it was when it was originally constructed. Imagine, imagine this, you know, it's so incredible. So anyway, let's get to the next pyramid. Okay, so the second pyramid on the Giza Plateau, we have the Great Pyramid, and then we have the second pyramid, which is attributed to Pharaoh Khafre, was constructed around 2570 BC, and Khafre was Khufu's son. Like the bent pyramid we looked at, the pyramid attributed to Khafre has some of its original casing stones at its apex. It too is a humongous structure at 448 feet tall and with a similar footprint to the Great Pyramid and similar stone construction with each stone weighing in at about 2.5 tons. What's incredible about Khafre's Pyramid right, is that it's built on top of a platform. The platform that, was, that this thing is built on, the stones comprising that platform are absolutely massive. Um, so Hyla, I remember her measuring out one of the stones, just you know, walking across like 25 feet by 25 feet or something like that, just one stone, right? That's the surface of the platform. And um, I can't even estimate how, how much it weighed. I mean, I don't know. Well, how did they do this? Again, how did they do this? So they build this platform, which is about 30 feet thick. 
In this photo I took, NEXT is sitting at the bottom part of the platform, and above him you can see the thickness of the stones used to construct it. It is 30 feet thick, and the Pyramid of Khafre sits on top of this platform. Astonishing, isn't it? But again, because it's built on a platform, it has the appearance of being higher or taller than Khufu's Pyramid. Really interesting. Maybe the son wanted to say, I'll do his dad. I don't know. But in any case, uh, who knows? So that's Khafre's Pyramid. Okay, the final pyramid of the, of, the, of, the, of the seven pyramids that we're looking at is Menkara's pyramid. Now, Menkara was Khafre's son. Okay, so we had Khufu, you know, who was Sneferu's son, and we had Khafre, who was Khufu's son, and we had Menkara, who was Khafre's son. Hey, not bad, I got that right. In any case, it was built around 2510 BC, and it is the smallest of the three very famous pyramids on the Giza Plateau. Now, the massive gouge you see in this pyramid, okay, was actually done by a sultan named Al-Aziz Uthman in 1196 AD. He was told there was a treasure buried underneath the pyramid, so he took his men and they tried to disassemble the pyramid. And apparently, it was so, the task was so arduous, they decided to abandon it. Um, because these pyramids were so well made. So apparently, uh, another theory is that the Sultan used these stones to, uh, to fortify Cairo, make it more of a fortified city. So either way, they did manage to create this huge gash in the, in the pyramid, uh, but that's about it, thank God. Menkara was the builder of the last great large pyramid. Um, and then after that, pyramid building took a real dive. Um, all the, there are about a, over, a little over 100 pyramids in Egypt, okay, which you may, may or may not have known this. But apparently, um, the, the, the remaining pyramids uh, are very small and in various stages of decay or disrepair. They're falling apart, that kind of thing, right? So that takes us to the end of this section. <laughs> contents of this innocuous little cigar box possibly change what we think we know about the construction of the pyramid, when it was constructed, and who constructed it. Let me tell you the story. Back in 1872, a British explorer named Wayman Dixon found some very unusual objects in what is called the Queen's Chamber inside the Great Pyramid. Interestingly, these objects were hidden. In other words, he was looking for hidden chambers. So he, took, he was taking a metal rod and he was poking the walls. Well, he finds this, what we call an air shaft today. It's about eight inches by eight inches, and it goes up through the, through the body of the pyramid. So, and that's a whole other story, but essentially he finds in this sealed chamber, sealed chamber, he finds a dolerite ball, which is a stone ball, a copper hook, and a piece of wood. So he takes the dolerite ball and the copper hook and he sends it to the British Museum where they reside today. The piece of wood he gave to his assistant, a Dr. James Grant, and who, he puts it in a cigar box and James Grant donates it to the Museum of Aberdeen in Scotland where it was promptly lost for 70 years. <laughs> the one thing we could carbon date was lost for 70 years. It was in the wrong collection, in the Asian collection. Lost, that is, until a few months ago, when curatorial assistant Abir Eladeni recognized the object as out of place in the Asian exhibit and discovered it was one of the lost Dixon relics. She worked at the Cairo Museum prior to her work at, in Aberdeen, which is kind of interesting. So she knew what it was, and she knew how important it was. So here's where it gets interesting. A few months ago, it was carbon dated, and the results are shocking. The wooden relics are dated not to the traditionally accepted time frame of 2560 BC that we all know about, when it was believed Khufu built the Great Pyramid, but instead they're dated to a staggering 3341 to 3094 BC. That is 500 years before it is believed the Great Pyramid was constructed. Wow. Now, some people say that the wood, cedar, is a very rare wood in Egypt, trees, you know, in Egypt at the time, and they believed it was part of a very old tree, maybe a 300, 400 year old tree, and it was kept for a long time. Okay, that's one camp. The other camp says, well, we need to revise the timeline of the pyramids. Who built this thing, right? Because now we're talking about 
before that time frame of the old kingdom that we looked at in the video. All I want to demonstrate to you is that how one relic, one item can throw everything off. What we think we know can change on a dime by scientific evidence. Of course, it's how we interpret that evidence that makes it all real or not real. So now we've come to the final part of the video, the apex, if you will. And I have to say thank you for watching and I hope you've enjoyed it. So I hope you found it interesting and informational and maybe enlightening and inspirational. We've only had a glimpse of the pyramids of Egypt, just a glimpse. There is so much more to this and I encourage you to go with NEXT to Egypt and explore them for yourself. Now, what did the pyramids teach me? Well, in the Bent Pyramid, as I was <laughs> bumbling down that 260 foot long, three foot by three foot descending passage, I stopped in the middle and I looked back up, which I shouldn't have done. And I see this little square of white light, you know, that was the outside. And then I looked down, and I see this little square of darkness, and that was the descent, of course. And I got a little wigged out. I mean, I was, I didn't realize it was claustrophobic, but apparently I was. And I got, you know, started to panic. So I thought to myself, if I go back up, right, to the familiar outside where I was, no one's gonna say anything. But then I thought, wait a minute, I came all this way to climb back out of the pyramid and not explore it? What's wrong with me? I had to challenge myself and challenge my fears. I guess it was claustrophobic and I never knew it. A couple of deep breaths and I continued my way down. Later that night, I had an epiphany. That was a metaphor for my life. The familiar past, all right, going back out the pyramid, climbing back out that chamber, all right, is not where you want to be, right? And the future is not where you want to be either because, well, look at it this way. The past is filled with regrets, right? The future is filled with anxiety. You don't know what's going to happen to you. So the only place to be is in the present, right? And that's that was meant for my life. When you look back in the past and you, you obsess about these things and you get upset about the oh I should have done this, I should have done, I shouldn't have done this, I shouldn't have done that. Okay. It's just regret. There's nothing you can do about it. You can't change the past. When you look into the future, it's anxiety. You just don't know what's gonna happen. Well, you can't do anything about that either until it happens. So what do you do? You live in the present moment, right? What a metaphor, huh? Isn't that incredible. And that really stayed with me. Now, the Great Pyramid, when I walked outside, the window, just as I walked out, after I explored it and walked out, this huge breeze came up. And it was a cool night, which was nice, and it just beautiful breeze. And a message came to me. My soul is at peace. And to this day, I don't know exactly what that means, but I can tell you that when I left the Great Pyramid, I felt that my soul was at peace. I had either completed something, some kind of maybe initiation, or there was something maybe in a past life that was resolved. I don't know. I don't even know if I believe in past lives, okay? All I can tell you is that I had this sense of peace and calm like I've never experienced before. It's kind of like being in Nepal at the birthplace of the Buddha. You know, you get this sense of calm and peace. So something happened to me in the Great Pyramid, but I just want you to know how important it is to actually go to these places and experience them for yourself. That's where the experience happens. And you'll see in the next video, we talk about the, uh, the, the temples and the Sphinx. Very powerful experiences. In any case, I hope you've enjoyed this video. And I hope it's shed some light on some of the more interesting aspects of Egypt. And I hope it's inspired you to go. And like I said, if you go, go with NEXT. It's the only way to go. Thank you for watching.